Good evening and welcome on this Wednesday evening. Welcome to Wednesdays in the Word. I'm Reverend John Kenny, the pastor of Third Baptist Church, and I'm so grateful that you are with us on this Wednesday evening as we share in a sacred time of study around the Word of the Lord. I want you to go ahead and invite somebody to join us tonight. Join us as we crack open the Word of the Lord, as we come around the Word of God, as we gather as a community of faith, as we come before the Lord as disciples trying to become all that God has created us to be. We invite you to join us tonight for this our sacred time of study, sacred time of worship, sacred time of mental and spiritual consecration, setting ourselves apart, studying to show ourselves approved, workmen needing not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God. I'm grateful for your presence on tonight. I hope and pray that you are excited about what we are partaking in, excited about this time of study, Wednesdays in the Word. I'm so grateful to be able to share with you each and every Wednesday night. It is my pleasure, my honor, my privilege to be able to come before you and to be able to grow alongside you and to journey alongside you and to struggle alongside you as one brother with another brother and sister. Amen. To the glory of our God. Look, why don't you go ahead and let somebody know. Third Baptist Church is live right now, Wednesdays in the Word, as we study the Word of the Lord. And so since you're all gathered tonight, I hope and pray that you are well and that your minds are free and that your spirit is open to what God is going to do with us on tonight. We are excited about this study on tonight because it's a it's a it's a time for us to really get a glimpse into what the church is being called into in this hour. We're going to talk tonight about Pentecost and the church. The church and Pentecost because we are post Pentecostal believers. We are post the Pentecostal experience that we find in the book of Acts. And then the question becomes, what, what do we do now? What happens now? What, what implications does that mean for us as the body of Christ, as the believer, as the church? So we're going to jump into this tonight and we're going to allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead us and guide us and to prayerfully enlighten us and give us fresh revelation, fresh insight into what God is trying to get done in your life and in mine. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We honor you for your name, O oh God, for your name is great. We bless you for the privilege that you've given us to share around your word on tonight. We ask you to simply meet us in this, our sacred time of study. Meet us in this time because we recognize that we can never be absent your presence, that where there are two or three gathered and your name is mentioned, your word says, there you are in the midst. And so we believe you are with us on tonight. So show yourself mighty. Bless my neighbor on tonight. Give them fresh understanding. Give them fresh clarity. Give them fresh revelation. Holy Spirit, minister to us on this evening. And we promise to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, we're grateful to have you with us on tonight, my brothers and my sisters. I want you to go ahead now and invite somebody to join us tonight as we share in this our sacred time of study to the glory of our God. Tonight we want to look at tonight uh, the church and Pentecost. Pentecost and the church. We've just come out of uh, Pentecost Sunday on this past Sunday. And Pentecost is a very significant and monumental time in the life of the church because of what Pentecost means for the church. And we want to look at that tonight um, from an angle tonight that hopefully and prayerfully will give us some fresh insight, some fresh understanding, and also, more importantly, will give us some fresh fuel to move us and guide us into where we believe God wants to take all of us into. 
So having said all that tonight, my brothers and my sisters, I want you to turn with me, please. Turn with me to Acts. Acts chapter number two. Put your finger on Acts chapter number two and beginning at verse number one. And we'll be reading tonight where I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And the word of God says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Let me stop right there to, to just expound on and give you some, some contextual relevance to that first verse. Pentecost was not necessarily in a, a day of power that the church received, but Pentecost was historically and traditionally one of the celebratory feasts that occurred in the Jewish culture. They, they, people went to Jerusalem, Jews went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Feast of Pentecost was an agricultural celebration. It was a time when the barley harvest was given unto the Lord. It's a time that was agriculturally recognized for a time of celebration from an agricultural standpoint. And they didn't go to Jerusalem. All these Jews did not bombard Jerusalem for the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit. They didn't go for that reason. They went to honor their tradition, to honor their culture, to honor their custom, to go into Jerusalem to celebrate this wonderful feast. So when you see verse one where it says, all the believers were meeting together in one place. They, they were in Jerusalem and they were celebrating, preparing themselves for the Feast of Pentecost. And on the Feast of Pentecost, on that particular day, verse 2, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them his, this ability, these Jews. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter number one, uh, that small group of Jews who were in Jerusalem, they were in Jerusalem, they were told to wait for the promise. But they were in Jerusalem because of the simple fact that it was a time of the feast. It was a time of the celebration. It was a time where they would go and honor their custom and honor their tradition. So they happened to be in Jerusalem, the place where Jesus told them to go to fulfill not only their custom, but also to fulfill the prophetic declaration that God was going to do something significant on that day, that God would take a day of tradition and transform it into a supernatural occurrence that will accomplish the divine purpose of God. That God would take a day that was marked as a traditional moment on the calendar and turn that thing around to, to mean something significant in the overall purpose that God has and had for the believers. That's a good spot to remind all of us tonight that God reserves every right, God reserves every opportunity to take our traditions and give them new meaning and new significance for the life of every believer. They were in this room, they were all together. Now we know why they were together. They were together primarily because they were afraid to come out. They were together primarily because Jesus had told them to wait right there. They were together because they were, they were unsure as to what their next move was going to be. They were all together because there was safety in numbers. They were all together because they had been instructed by the master to wait right there to receive the promise that God had told them God was going to give unto them. And so they were instructed to wait, and that's what they did. They were waiting in Jerusalem in that room, and there were also it was also a time of festive celebration because you'll see where it says, "All oh, there were other devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem during this particular time because, it, again, it was a time of the feast and that God was going to do something significant during the time of feast. Now, from the church's perspective, from the church's perspective and the meaning of Pentecost in the life of the church, because when we see this story, it, it has been historically in some circles told, identified as the day when the church was conceived or church was born. But I want to suggest to you tonight 
that the church was not conceived at Pentecost. The church just received power at Pentecost because when Jesus called those disciples to follow him, the church had already been formed. The church had already been established. The church had already been galvanized. The church just did not have the power yet to do what Jesus had called them together to accomplish. They had not yet received the supernatural endowment of power necessary to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and all other parts of the world. They had not yet received the power to become what they were supposed to become. They had not yet received the power to function in the purpose upon which they had been gathered. They had been gathered in the gospel. They had been gathered as Jesus walked along the seashores, calling people, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They had already been formulated or formalized, but they had not yet been galvanized with power. So Pentecost is not necessarily the creation or the birthing of the church. Pentecost is the empowering of the church, the empowering of the believers to accomplish the overall objective upon which God had assembled them together. So from the church's perspective, one of the things we want to consider here is that Pentecost is a time of power. That God, that God has now empowered the church with the ability to accomplish her divine call. Now, when you understand something about divine power and the, and the power that God has begun to pour out on his people through the spirit of God, power, divine power, supernatural heavenly power cannot be manufactured by human effort. That's important because the church is never going to be able to manufacture or produce the kind of power needed to accomplish what God has called them together to accomplish. The church is never going to be able to manufacture or construct or conceive the kind of power necessary to do what God has assembled them to do. God initiated this power. Therefore, the church must depend on God to accomplish what God wants to get done in the life of the church. The church is not supposed to be an, an, an agent, if you will, a community, if you will, where people are trying to do things in their own vein to create their own kind of power. The church is not the place where people come to establish their power, but the church is where the people have been galvanized and formed and brought together by God to receive God. God's power to be able to do what God has assembled them for. So when you talk about Pentecost and you talk about the church, the first thing we want to be clear about is that this is a, an opportunity for us to experience the power that God has in store for us. So that means every time we come together as believers out of our tradition, hear me well, out of our traditional occurrences, every time we come together out of tradition or out of routine, it is a moment in time where we are available, where God has made available for the church the opportunity to experience a release of God's power. God, I felt that thing right there. Every time we come together, we have been positioned by God to experience the possibility of a release of God's power. And that's why we have to be careful and mindful how we treat our coming together, how we view our coming together, how we view our being assembled by the Spirit of God. Because what God may be trying to get done in our coming together is something so supernatural that it, it changes the trajectory of our movement. It changes the trajectory of our flow. It changes what we do after we have come together. How many times do we come together and then we, we look at the watch, look at our clock and say, we're going to be in here for an hour. We're going to be in here for 75 minutes. And we want to make sure we hit all the right spots to say we had church, but never really be able to experience the power of God in our coming together. So Pentecost in the life of the church is about the release of power. 
And we should be coming every time we gather, not out of tradition, not out of form, not out of fashion, but we should be coming expecting for God to release some power in our midst because it takes the power of God upon the life of the church for us to be able to accomplish the ministry and the purpose upon which God has called us. Not only is there power available, but I want you to understand what happened here at Pentecost. What happened when God began to move in the midst? What happened when the Spirit of God, that Joel said, and that day I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. What happened in that moment is very subtle in the text. And if you if you're not careful, you are going to miss it. In verse 3, it says, then what looked like flames or tongues of fire. There's something about that word fire that is important for us to understand. Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in my, oh, shandalusa, shut up in my bones. It's a consume. God is a consuming fire. God, in his word, he says, I am a consuming fire. Now, what does it mean when you talk about fire? Fire, my brothers and sisters, is necessary in the pure purification process of precious metals. Whenever you take gold, in order for gold to be purified, it goes through the fire. Lord, help us today. And the presence of God manifested by what seemed to be tongues of fire highlights the purifying nature of God's presence, that the church ought to be experiencing a purification. The church ought to be going through a purifying process that God is beginning to remove the impurities from our lives, the impurities from our coming together, the impurities from our meeting, that God is doing a work and not just us collectively, but God is doing such a work in us individually that we begin to exemplify the transformation that is taking place in our lives. God was now beginning to do a work in them. So when Jesus says, you shall be baptized with the Spirit and with fire, he's talking about you will be baptized in this process called purification. See, it's not just enough for the church to come together. It's now it's important for the church to be sanctified by the purifying power of God's Spirit. These disciples were in that upper room and God was now beginning to do something significant in them, significant in and who they were that they then might be able to be uh, to be used on the level that God was trying to get them to be used on and sometimes sometimes we miss out on the true level that God wants to use us because we have not allowed ourselves to embrace the purification process i put it to you like this if you were to go in your yard today or tomorrow, if you were to go in your yard and get you a little eight ounce cup of a glass, a cup or something, clear glass, and you were to put about this much dirt in the bottom of that glass, let dirt be in the bottom of the glass and then run some water in it, run some water in it. If you keep running water in it, at some point the, the water will begin to flush the dirt out of the glass. But if you keep running it long enough and it looks like all the dirt is gone, if you hold the dirt up to the light, what you will see is that there's still some particles of dirt left in that glass. Just when it looked like it was clear, just when it looked like you had removed all of the dirt, it takes the light to shine on the glass to let you know that there's still some particles of dirt left in it. Come on in here tonight, y'all, because one of the things that purifi the purification process does is the purification process purifies us from all of the things that we think are gone out of us, but it allows us to be the pure vessels that God wants to use in order for us to serve God the manner that God desires for us to serve him. God has to purify our motives, purify our prejudices, purify our biases, purify our racism, purify all those things we have that are in that are embedded in us that can to, uh, potentially rob us of the true use that God wants to get out of us. 
Here they were. They were in a room and the fires like tongues, tongues like fire rather, was now beginning to move on them. They were beginning to experience this move of God where God was disconnecting them, if you will, from some of the things that would stand in the way of them being able to be used by God. Again, fire removes the impurities from precious metals. And in order for the church to operate in the purity that God has called the church to operate in, in order for the church to function in the degree of purity that God wants us to function in, there has to be some impurities be removed from our lives. So during this time of Pentecost, God was beginning to refine them. And I don't know if you know it or not, but every now and again, God will take you and God will take me and God will take the church through what is known as the refiner's fire, not to destroy us, but to make us better coming out, to refine us, to remove the impurities from us so that we will be in a posture and a place where we are of better use in the kingdom of God. So Pentecost is not only about power, but Pentecost should remind us about the purifying process that God is going to take us through. Now, let me stop right here for a moment to remind you of us tonight that Pentecost should never be viewed as a one-time event in your journey of faith. Pentecost should never be viewed as a moment in time on the calendar of your experience. You and I ought to be experiencing Pentecost on a daily basis. We ought to be experiencing the power of God and the purifying nature of God in our lives that God might bring us into a brand new understanding and a brand new revelation of what it it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. So not only is the, the power fall on that day, is it a day of power, but it's also a day of purification. It's a time of purification. It marks a purification period in the life of the church. It marks a purifying moment in the life of the church. It marks the beginning of a purifying process that the church has to go through. And then there is the presence of God. Listen, the church's witness is a testimony to God's power and God's work. The church is a witness, a living witness to the testimony of God's power and God's work. The power of God that rests on the church and the work of God that's being done in the life of the community of faith testifies to the presence of God in the earth around us. The church is designed and purpose to have an impactful presence upon those in proximity of the church. Well, what do you see to that preacher? Look at what it says in verse five and every verse four, everyone was present, everyone present rather was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Verse five, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Six, when they heard the loud voice, noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Everybody heard their own languages being spoken and they were bewildered. What does that mean? That simply means that the presence of God had now impacted those in proximity of the church. Lord have mercy. That the power of God and the work of God in the life of God's disciples, God's believers, had now impacted those persons on the periphery of the where the church was located. And what it does is it gives witness to the presence of God. It gives witness to the power of God. It gives witness to the work of God to those who may not be familiar with the God of our salvation. Lord, help us today. Pentecost. Pentecost is about power. You ought to type that in the screen somewhere. It's about power. Pentecost is about the beginning of the purification process of the church is now going to be brought in to listen as a result of this renewed relationship that the church was going to have with God. This relationship that they were now experiencing with God was not a relationship they had had previously. And this new relationship would bring them into a new paradigm as to how God was going to deal with them. Y'all missed that tonight. It was power. It was purification. And then it gave testimony to the presence. As we begin to live in this post 
Pentecostal experience. We have been called by God. We've been challenged by God. We've been positioned by God to not only demonstrate the power of God, to not only allow the purifying presence of God do a work in us, but we have been called to give testimony to the presence of God in the communities around us. People ought to know that God is doing something significant in your life by virtue of how you are now being moved, how you are moving in their midst. People ought to be able to experience something significant about God at work in your life because of how your presence has now impacted their lives. Well, what do you mean, preacher? I don't see that in the storyline. They were talking, they were speaking in other languages. They were speaking in tongues. Now, let me help you tonight because I don't want to, I don't want to uh, confuse you any more than you may have already been confused. But your salvation is not indicative of whether or not you speak in tongues. This is not a text that says you are saved because you speak in tongues. They were brought into relationship with Jesus Christ before they ever uttered an unknown tongue. This story right here, the idea of speaking in tongues is not whether or not you give validation or evidence to your salvation. They were speaking in tongues for the purpose of reaching those around them so that those around them might know that God was active in their midst. Come on in here tonight, y'all, because the text says that people, the Jews, begin to hear them speak in their own language. Look, look at verse seven. They were completely well, verse six, they were they were they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers with all these different dialects, with all these different backgrounds, with all these different persons gathered in Jerusalem. Why? For the feast of Pentecost. They were gathered in Jerusalem and God did something with a small group of people that had an impact on the larger community. They began to hear words and testimony about God in their own language. And what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for me? It means that on the day of Pentecost, when God is working in your life, there ought to be some 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 a uh, 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 language that you speak that can identify with folk around you. You are, you have been positioned to speak a language that some people and only those people are able to understand. I've so Told you this before and I mentioned to you again that all of us come to our relationship with God with a history. We come to God as a fact that God has brought us out of something to bring us into something. God has brought us out of the places we were in to bring us into a new relationship with God, into a greater purpose for God, into a greater understanding of God. So therefore, by God bringing you out of something into something, God did not He's not going to uh, uh, eliminate your past experiences, but God wants to use those experiences that you might be able to help somebody else who was in the same thing you were in. You cannot speak the language of a butcher if you've never butchered meat. You cannot speak the language of a lawyer if you have never gone to law school. You can never speak the language of a doctor if you've never been to med school. You can never speak the language of an, of an addict if you've never been addicted. You can never speak the language of somebody who's been molested if you've never been molested. And so what God does is God uses our experiences. God uses our back. Grounds. God uses the things God brought us out of and then allows us to speak the language of those people who are still there to give testimony. Listen, because the text says that they were amazed because they were speaking wonderful things about what God has done. And at the end of verse 11, they were, uh, they, were, they were speaking in their own languages about the wonderful things God has done. And so you are able to speak a language about what God has done to people who are, who are in the same situation that God has brought you out of. Again, this text is not about you being saved. It is not about you speaking a language where you are saved. It's about you being able 
able to speak in an unknown language, an unknown tongue to help somebody who has been or is currently where God has brought you out of. So it's important to understand, my brothers and sisters, that you and I must be willing to allow God to work in us and to God to free us to the degree but we are willing to let God use us where we can speak a language to help somebody understand the great things that God has done in our lives because they may need to know that God is still able to do something with a person in their situation and nobody better can tell it like you. There's nobody who is more qualified, hey glory to God, more qualified to tell your story about what God has done outside of you. So on Pentecost, Pentecost reminds us from the church's perspective. It reminds us about power. It reminds us about the process of purification. It reminds us about the presence that God wants to establish in our lives. But then I want to help you here because it's going to be difficult right through here. Pentecost reminds us about the partnering process that comes along with our relationship with God. I want you to jump down to verse number 42 because this happens after Pentecost. This happens after the power of God fell. This happened after they begun, they began the purification process. This happened after they experienced that their presence in the community. In verse number 42, it says these words. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to the fellowship those who were being saved. That last part is important. Verses 42 through 47 is important because somewhere along this journey, especially post-COVID, people have begun to believe that they don't need to be in fellowship anymore. People have begun to believe that all they have to do is just sit at home and ignore and abandon the, for the assembling of the saints. What Pentecost did and what Pentecost does is it pushed the church to partner with God in the process of spiritual growth. Let me help you tonight because you are never going to grow spiritually outside of the community of faith. I don't care how much you spend on your own by yourself, you are never going to grow the way God intends for you to grow outside of the community of faith. The power of Pentecost led these believers, listen, to partner with God and what God was doing in their lives. Hear me well. Pentecost led the believers. It pushed the believers to a place where they were forced to partner with God in what they believed God was doing in their lives. And this also means that you and I have to be processed by the teachings of the word of God. Can I help you tonight? No single believer knows everything there is to know about the word of God. No single believer knows everything there is to know about God. And that's why as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another man. You and I have not been called to live on an island all by ourselves, but we have been called to a community of faith. And I challenge you, my brothers and sisters, I challenge you tonight to no longer let anything get in the way of you assembling with the saints. Don't let anything come between you and the, and the process work that God wants to get done in your life. Because every relationship is, is incumbent upon each person 
giving their all to the relationship. Every relationship depends the health, the, the, the success, the vibrancy, the life, the future of every relationship depends on each party doing their part to enhance and to fulfill the relationship. I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but when Jesus died on that cross, Jesus made a commitment to you. <laughs> when he died on that cross, he made a commitment to you and to me and to the church. He has already committed himself. The question is, are you and I going to commit ourselves to the life of this relationship? So, it's important to understand that Pentecost is not just a day on the calendar that happened, but Pentecost is a perpetual experience with God, that God is perpetually drawing us into a deeper relationship. God is perpetually bringing us into a place of purification. God is perpetually establishing our presence and our witness in the community, and God is perpetually processing you and processing me. And so our points of emphasis tonight, number one, no community of faith can exemplify God in their particular sphere of influence without God's power. We need the power of God to be effective and to be efficient. We need the power of God to validate the authenticity of our being together. We need the presence and the power of God to give validation to who we are as a community of faith. Second point of emphasis, the arrival of power within the faith community is intended to have communal impact. God has brought us together for the purpose of us having impact in the community around us. And a church that has no impact is a church that is dead. And God fills dead spaces with God's spirit. God fills dead spaces with God's power. God fills dead spaces with the life of Almighty God. And so the arrival of power, the Holy Spirit arrival, the Holy Spirit's arrival in the life of this early church and in the life of every church thereafter is designed for that community of faith to have an impact in the community around us because that's how we give testimony to the power of God and to the work of God. Thirdly, the believers are called to be processed by the word of God. Again, you and I will never become what God wants us to become if we refuse to be processed in the community of faith. If we refuse to allow the word of God, if we, if we refuse to allow ourselves to participate in worship, to participate in study, to participate in prayer, to participate in groups, if we refuse to do these things, we are saying we are not going to be committed to the life of our relationship. Pentecost and the church, it is more than you falling out on the floor speaking in tongues. Because speaking in tongues is a gift. And not everybody has the gift. Speaking in tongues is like the gift of prophecy. Not everybody has it. The gift of mercy, not everybody has it. The gift of teaching, not everybody has it. it. Speaking in tongues is not validation to your salvation. It simply means, are you in a place that you can allow God to use you to speak the language of those around you? Are you in a space where you are committing yourself to the teaching of the word of God, to prayer that is in the household of faith? Are you, have you committed yourself to fellowship in koinonia, to sharing, to small group study? Have you committed yourself 
to be purified by the fire of the Holy Spirit? Have you permitted yourself to be a witness to what God is doing in your life? That's what Pentecost is about. And that's the implication of Pentecost for the church. And with that, we are now challenged to live and to relive Pentecost each and every day of our lives. That we experience the depth, we discover the mystery that is found in this new relationship we have with Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your gift. We thank you for your spirit. And Father, we ask you now to bless us in this night. Bless us as we go through this day. Let us not see Pentecost as an event on a calendar, but let us view it as a perpetual experience that we have with you. Remind us, oh God, that you can take our routine traditions and you can turn them into something supernatural and spectacular. Help us, oh God, not to be so caught up in fulfilling our own routines and our own traditions, but let us be open and available to what you want to do with us and in us, that we might be available to new moves of power, available to new dispensations of your power, to be open to new revelations of who you are, to be open to what you want to do with us. Breathe on us again, O oh God, that we might experience the depth of who you really are in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, my beloved, I'm grateful that you joined us one more Wednesday for Wednesdays in the Word. It is my sincere prayer that you've been blessed tonight by this lesson. It's my sincere prayer that God will leave something on your heart that will push you into a greater level of understanding, a greater level of truth, and a greater level of awareness not only about God, but about who you are as the church. This has been Reverend Kenny. This has been Wednesdays in the Word. We're so grateful for your presence on tonight. And we thank God that you've joined us on tonight. Visit our website, thirdbaptisthampton.org, to find more information. If you feel so led tonight that you want to give an offering, if this teaching has blessed you tonight, you can go to the website, thirdbaptisthampton.org, click on the give link. You're able to give right there. You can also text the number on your screen right there, 1214V to 73256. That's 1214V to 73256. A link will be coming to your phone. You can give safe and secure on your phone if you're so led to give. I hope and pray that you have a wonderful rest of your evening a wonderful rest of your week. And again, this has been Reverend John Kennedy, pastor of Third Baptist Church. Until next week, be blessed, be encouraged, be faithful, and be strong to the glory of our God.